Today, I'm going to be talking about um, several topics, just going over the, the foundation of SOSA derived from MOSA principles, and then um, talking about different classes of electronic warfare, and types of systems, and then what are the needs for those types of, of uh, electronic warfare systems, how they then can be applied with new technology into a SOSA compliant product. And uh, then we'll get some takeaway items a little bit later on. So again, what Bob laid out, and again, we're going through the uh, five basic building blocks of MOSA, which is the Modular Open System Architecture Inif Initiative defined by DOD. Competition, new technology refresh, innovation, cost savings, and interoperability. Now, what happened was each of the three services took it upon themselves to implement their own version of MOSA. And these are kind of shown here as being derived in the three branches of the services, the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force, who created host CMOS and OMS as their view of, of MOSA. And many of those standards that were adopted by those three services were all the same, uh, especially the open VPX. And so it was determined that because they were so similar that they should be unified into a single SOSA initiative where uh, all of those come together now under that new organization called SOSA Sensor Open System Architecture. A nice milestone was last September when the first SOSA technical standard, release 1.0, was completed. It was a multi-year effort. It took a lot of work by a lot of, a lot of engineers and uh, government uh, personnel dedicated to this program. It's uh, available now for worldwide distribution, and we're already seeing a lot of foreign interest in this standard uh, for use around the world. It's not restricted and uh, it can be adopted by anyone who wishes to do so. Going forward, what we'll see is that DOD procurement uh, requirements will be mandating uh, the open system content in, in the products. So that's definitely underway now, it's already started. So the three different classes of electronic warfare system are the electronic attack, which includes uh, the active countermeasures, jamming, spoofing. Uh, and then the second class is electronic protection, which tends to counter the electronic attack part of electronic warfare. Um, adaptive spectrum, spread spectrum for um, lower detectability, multi-static systems for redundancy. And then the third is electronic support which is receiving signals to decide what they are and to perhaps take uh, action to determine uh, some uh, uh, strategies going forward based on what is de what's been detected. The interesting thing is that all of these different classes of warfare systems are now able to benefit from artificial intelligent, intelligence and machine learning technologies, which are becoming more and more important to electronic warfare. The artificial intelligence gives you um, adaptive radar countermeasures, autonomous cognitive radios, and uh, classification of signals, identification of signals and targets, and the exploitation of the spectrum. Another part of requirements for electronic warfare is low latency. This is especially important for the countermeasures, real-time countermeasures uh, like airborne, um, uh, airborne uh, countermeasures for radar. Another trend is increased signal bandwidth and then also higher signal frequencies. The carrier frequencies themselves are, are way, way up. And so these are some of the requirements of electronic warfare, but there are additional requirements as well. We're looking to get a higher dynamic range. What this will do is you will extend the usability of gathering the information from a radar system to longer distances or getting more detail about the target. Signals are becoming more and more complex in radar to achieve some of the, the functions that they need to. Uh, and so as a result, 
the signals being acquired have to have more capabilities to in decrypt uh, and decode those signals. Swap, of course, is extremely important, especially for air, airborne uh, and the smaller UAVs that are um, uh, that are becoming increasingly popular. And last, electronically steered uh, phased array antennas are really becoming um, widely used to have multiple elements within an antenna capable of steering the receive and transmit signal beams uh, for uh, a lot of really nice advantages without the mechanical structures of, of, a, of a dish that uh, were previously done for that kind of um, steering. There's some new, nice new technologies that are out there. The, the one that, that's really interesting we found extreme interest in is the RFSOC. Uh, there's a new generation three, and this shows you the basic building blocks that are part of that chip and why it's so important. Eight channels of high-speed RF input and output with data, data converters running from five gigahertz giga samples per second for the uh, A to Ds and 9.8 giga samples per second for the uh, D to As. A powerful ultra scale FPGA, uh, ultra scale plus FPGA fabric and resources, dual 100 gigabit Ethernet interface, high speed uh, interface engines for other IO, PCI Express Gen 3, for example, and then a built in farm of ARM processors to handle the system control. What you have on this single chip then is a complete eight channel low latency RF transceiver subsystem. And it's really ideally suited for phased array antennas because it has eight channels of receive and transmit all built in as part of the chip itself. We're taking a look at another new device is the um, Xilinx ACAP Versal AI core device. And it has a, a wealth of different types of processors. Over on the left top, you'll see the ARM dual core Cortex A72 and the Cortex R5 processors. In the center, you'll see the UltraScale Plus programmable logic with uh, RAM resources. Over on the right, you'll see AI engines and DSP engines. They're all joined together by a network on chip, which means communication between and among these different resources is made very efficient. There's also a plan, platform management controller down at the lower left. And then the network at chip also connects to a lot of different interfaces to get to memory and to get off the board with very high, high rate multi-rate uh, uh, multi ethernet. Uh, so it, it's a very, very powerful chip. And again, those structures support the uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning that is becoming more and more important for um, our electronic warfare. SOSA specifies a lot of VITA standards, and here are just a listing of them. There's card specs, there's mechanical power management, different IO protocol, uh, notably the VITA 49, which is a radio transport protocol for um, uh, uh, specifying packetization of signals, system management, VITA 46.11, it's also new connections for the backplane. Now, <clears throat> the, the rear panel I.O. is mandated by SOSA for all of the uh, analog inputs and optical inputs and outputs. And so there are new connectors that have been devised, new housings that have all been incorporated within VITA standards to support, in this example, up to 20 RF coaxial connections on the backplane and two uh, optical MT ferrules, each with 24 fibers in. This, this gives you a lot of very high density, high performance, high bandwidth IO across the backplane to comply with the uh, new SOSA requirements. So here are four different products from Mercury that exemplify some of this technology that we've talked about in actual products that are available today. The first one on the left is a dual ACAP Versal AI core Xilinx device that we talked about before. Again, with AI, ML, and DSP capabilities, this is a 6U board um, and uh, a one-inch pitch. 
The next one to the right is a uh, Xeon scalable server class processor that has built-in secure embedded framework. This, this gives you very high security built into the hardware and the software for um, uh, resistance to uh, um, you know, uh, cybercrime, uh, tampering, uh, attacks, and so forth. The next one over this is the first safe Intel Core uh, Gen 11 processor. And this is uh, built along a built safe, uh, which is a very high security for, um, uh, for aircraft as far as of, of mission critical uh, support functions for flight safety. And they, these include the DO254, the DO178C, um, uh, standards and uh, again, uh, again, it's very, very safe, highly certified uh, processor board. The last one on the right is the RFSOC Gen 3, which has the data converters we talked about, multi channel synchronization, the ARM processors. Again, this is a 3U uh, VPX. So we have both 3U and 6U, a lot of choices. Uh, and these can all be used in together or independently with, with other Mercury products or other vendor products to comply with the open standard, uh, um, open vendor approach to SOSA. So what does SOSA really mean for electronic warfare? Here's some quick benefits. First of all, it's, it's faster, easier um, acquisition, easier to put new technology in. It improves life cycles stimulates innovation. There's a competitive advantage for a vendor that does a better job of the, of the task with better specs. And smaller vendors can compete very nicely by offering um, solutions to the uh, tier one vendors so they can get, the primes can get their systems into a bid with a high SOSA content. That'll help them win the bid and get deliveries with lower risk. We have a supply chain problem right now. Um, we're going, we're getting through it. SOSA product breadth is going to ramp up as we get into the certification process, which is now just beginning. It's underway. Some of the takeaways here uh, today would be, there's a lot of membership, not only including DOD, but also private industry vendor organizations. We've got the technical standard released. We've got dozens of SOSA aligned products headed for certification. DOD really is committed to SOSA, to the benefits of, of open standards. And even though there may be some, some short-term challenges like the certification process and supply chain issues, uh, that will uh, get better over time. And SOSA really offers a long-term clear benefit to everybody involved in EW. Here are some links to more resources from uh, Mercury, Pentec, SOSA websites, and the uh, link to the SOSA technical standard. And if you'd like to join either group, you can click on these links and, and uh, request membership in either one of these organizations. They're very, very valuable, both um, uh, the, the open group and, and Vita. So uh, that will do it for me. I really appreciate your attending today.